So, um, just to introduce us uh, uh, quickly, um, Amitendu and myself have been discussing this topic for quite some time. And uh, we thought that what would be an um, interesting topic both for European Union, both for France, also for ESSEC, also for uh, uh, NUS, and also in our Singapore campus. So um, the, the, the issue today is uh, not only from looking at uh, the financial crisis or the recession in Europe, but also the challenges and opportunities and what we think that has an effect for India and Southeast Asia. Uh, my uh, role at this point would be only to discuss about uh, India and what I think might be interesting uh, in terms of India and the European Union issues that I think might be important. Being uh, from the strategy department of ESSEC and specializing in international business, I will focus my uh, points on those lines, not going into touching into the economics, not touching into finance, or not, in, not touching into geopolitics. But let me see if I can carve out a small niche from this place, which is, which is an interesting milieu of uh, people working uh, in different spheres on the same topic. So this is for my students. I'm the associate dean of the Global MBA, so uh, my students are here. So uh, 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 a little bit about my uh, as a professor of uh, international business. What is this decision about? And we have this seen that it's a more mostly an issue about cycle of confidence, which means that uh, the growth happens, then there is uh, then there is overgrowth, and then. What we find is uh, people uh, or the companies doing some things which they shouldn't do. Governments do some things which they shouldn't do. Then uh, there is some type of recession. And then the, there is a type of crunch. Then we do not do what we should do. And then again, we, we try to come back to uh, a way where we say that, OK, now the recession is not there. Recession will never be there. And then we are in a good phase. So this is the cycle of confidence that we always see happening from the, from the last 20 years. The second point which I want to argue is the India and other South Asian countries are affected because, not only because the European Union and the US is, is in a difficult situation today, contrary to what my colleague was saying, John is saying, it is, they have an effect because of the trade and the financial channels have been restricted for these countries because they have bilateral and multilateral discussions within this uh, within this framework also um, a, a, even if a recession is averted in europe as you're saying but if both us and europe together has uh, a difficulty for over a period of time of course india and southeast asia would also have an effect on this the second point is the austerity measures by european countries uh, and the failing consumer expenditures may affect exports which means that uh, when European Union and the US has difficulties, there is a ripple effect which comes to India and to Southeast Asia. What happens next is uh, there is a capital flight, which means that the foreign institutional investors would leave, uh, would leave um, the equity market, which has happened in India, and that has led to a steep dep depreciation in the rupee. And also, there's a high public debt, which means that, uh, like Greece, Spain, Portugal, Ireland, the, 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 which is uh, having difficulty, which means that India is also having difficulty with such a high public debt. And uh, the, the framework, which is interesting at this point of time, for, uh, for uh, my understanding of this issue, that we can divide this phenomena into three main points. One is the macro phenomena between the, the two uh, regions. One is the micro phenomena, which is what is affecting the, the, the companies, what is affecting the real life of the people in those two those areas. And the last are the implications and the opportunities and challenges for the both. The world economic situation and prospects of 2012 talks about uh, that um, the Asian developing economies would like you to have a significant blow through a drop in the exports and GDP growth would accelerate. Though the growth of India, though the growth of China have been, uh, for the last <coughs> five years, have been more than six to five, six to seven percent, but this year, as we see, that the growth has reduced and barely uh, Iran, Nepal, Pakistan have registered a growth of around four percent. 
Also, there is an effect because of this. There is an effect on the macro phenomena that uh, the downgrading of um, uh, the credit rating is agencies of the country. So when the downgrading happens, again, we go back to the cycle of confidence. The capital flight goes out, and that is an effect on the uh, uh, that is an effect on the economy as a whole. Uh, what I see here also is, uh, I don't know if I am only seeing or if others have seen it also, but I see a paradox here, which is uh, quite striking from my point of view. And it's also reported last, uh, I think, uh, on this weekend that the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute has reported that India has in recent years become the world's largest recipient of arms, accounting for 10% of the global arms imports in the period of 20, 2007 and 2011. Which means that the, the nations uh, which sell arms to emerging markets, to, to, Asia, to countries like India, they are selling arms, but uh, India as such has, has reduced its growth. And in contrast, China, which is the largest recipient of arms between 2002 to 2006, fell fourth in the place of 2007-2011 due to indigenization over the past couple of decades. And as John mentioned, that both the Prime Ministers of, uh, both the President and the Prime Minister of US, of, um, of uh, France and UK was there in February uh, in India trying to, um, trying to sell many, uh, many projects. One of them was fighter jets. And also, though Russia is also not in the European Union, but it also went in the same month to the same country, in the same city, uh, to discuss about the deals which might turn the, 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 uh, the issues of not doing well in Europe to, uh, to a better place, probably because of these huge uh, investments, both sides, from Europe to India and Asia, and from India to Europe. The second framework, which uh, or the frame which I would like to use, is the micro framework, which means that uh, MNCs uh, who operate in on both the uh, countries face both challenges and opportunities. Challenges in the form of uh, reforming the tax structure. Recently, there has been an issue about tax in India on the MNCs, and um, opportunities in the form of growth markets was also there. So basically, again. One, one hand, the tax structure has, has been revised in emerging markets because of the difficulties, whereas the, the MNCs need to be there because of the growth. Uh, the second phenomenon which has been uh, important in the recent past is sourcing of talent. So in the region, basically in Southeast Asia, there has been a sourcing of talent from India, from China, because uh, there is a steep competition also because uh, there is a there is a talent uh, uh, talent leaves are leaving talent leaving from Europe to emerging markets like Brazil, like India, like Singapore, and this has been a phenomenon where the two govern where the governments from both the regions are trying to see why there is a talent outflow. Uh, the, of course, there is a growth of new business opportunities. For example, in the last six months, as I talk about India more, there has been a lot of. Um, uh, financial, a uh, lot, lot of, lot of um, uh, decisions taken by the India government, for example, opening up of the retail sector, which, is, which has been going on for a long time, which has huge implications for retailers like Walmart, retailers like Carrefour, retailers like Tesco's of the region. Then, of course, the insurance bill has been passed and the private banking bill, which has also been, which will be passed very soon, which is in the table. And for our business, since we are in the business of education, I think there's a source, there's an interesting, interesting issue about uh, the recession and of course the, not the recession, because the source of talent pool for higher education has an effect. Uh, for one, less jobs means higher risk and students to invest for higher education in Europe. For example, since you are here, UK has strengthened uh, or, or redesigned the, the, the visa policy the policies for jobs, the policies for even for looking for jobs, yeah. the policies for students to come in, which has a huge effect between the two. So I, I stop here, and when we discuss about the implications, I can come back to the implications of that point. Thank you.
Thank you very much. And let's move on to our third speaker, uh, Dr. Alit from uh, ISAS. Thank you, Michael. And uh, thank you, Ashok. I am actually uh, the farthest, farthest on the right from the center. That doesn't necessarily uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> should should be taken as a contribution to the rightest of views in, in both senses. But what I'll try to do is to uh, just uh, substantiate some of the issues which have come from both of my colleagues till now. And I think both of them have uh, raised very important aspects of the discussion that we have today. Now, uh, when we talk about Europe and Asia and uh, recession, crisis, all these things, these are all very negative and gloomy terms. Uh, the point is that, is it necessary in the first place to subscribe to such group? Now, as a student of uh, the regional architecture, what I cannot ever help or avoid thinking is that Asia is actually a very good place to discuss the troubles of Europe because Asia suffered from a financial crisis less than 15 years ago. Now that crisis in a number of ways was actually more than a financial crisis. It became a social crisis in certain countries, it erupted as a political crisis. But it also became a great lesson in learning and experience. Let's look at some of the causalities. When Asia suffered in 1997, Europe didn't. When Asia suffered and for three, four, uh, three or four years it went into a prolonged economic contraction, Europe didn't. This time when Europe suffered, Asia has gone into contraction. Now what does this mean? First, it puts to a complete end the whole notion of decoupling. There's nothing called decoupling anymore. Asia depends on Europe for economic sustenance. Why? Because Asia is a producer for Europe. And what it produces for Europe is eventually consumed by Europe and that in turn fuels consumption in Asia. So to that extent, this equation can change only if Asia by itself becomes a cycle of production and consumption. Or on the other hand, there are other regions that come up which run into this similar cycle of production and consumption. So I don't really think it is, it is in a sense, at this point in time, rational for Asia to say that Europe is gone and over. Europe, even a time Europe, will create troubles for Asia, as it is. Now, Having said that, what's wrong with Europe? Uh, my colleagues uh, pointed out the basics that are wrong. Now, I think the problem with uh, a situation like the one that we are seeing in Europe is that we use the word crisis too lightly, too frequently, much as we use the word great as an objective. What Europe is going through is actually a prolonged economic downturn. Now, there are points in time in the economic histories of nations, countries, and the world, when cycles last much longer than they are expected. And this holds true for both booms and bursts. I'm not saying this is a boom and bust scenario. What, what we are simply getting to see is that there is a prolongation of economic downturn where as a collective of 27 countries, or more specifically as a Eurozone entity, the zone is unable to record the kind of economic performance and register the kind of economic activity that is expected out of it, given its economic size. Now, having said that, there is of course a problem of credit. There is a problem of fiscal imbalance. There is a huge problem of macroeconomic fundamentals, head to head, compared. India's macroeconomic fundamentals are even worse. Are we saying that India is passing through a crisis? No, we are using the word. India is passing through an economic slowdown. And why is that? Simply because the Goldman Sachs fits India. India is still a part of the BRICS, expected to become the third largest country by 2050. Europe is nowhere expected to be seen by the 2050 notion as far as the Goldman Sachs goes. So the BRICS dream lives on. The question is whether the BRICS dream 
will become a reality minus your own. I think that's really taking the dream too far. Now, the bigger question in this whole context is that whether what Europe is experiencing by itself is, is a serious issue for any experiment other than the experiment of the Eurozone and for Euro as a currency. Now to that extent, these are matters which are internal to Europe. I don't think the rest of the world has any business to talk about this except for being worried about the fact that again given its economic size and importance, if the Eurozone sends out signals that it is unable to hold itself together, then there will be volatilities in the foreign exchange market. There will be other hiccups in other places. The Euro, despite all the doomsday sales, has still held up as a reserve currency. The dollar continues to struggle as a reserve currency. There has not been any change in the reserve currency baskets of the world. There was a movement to propel an Asian currency unit. In the 2006 ADB annual meeting, it was preceded nowhere. Asia is nowhere close to coming up with an alternative currency. So let's face it, we will have to live with what we have got. And there is not much that Asia can do in this regard. In fact, if there is a crisis of a geographic, political, and economic entity, then the ASEAN itself is also going through a number of similar crises. Now, when one looks at it from the point of view of India, and how does India actually visualize the crisis in Europe? Again, we use the world crisis we use here. I think Ashok uh, very correctly mentioned the micro nuances from the point of business. Now, I think India would make a fundamental mistake. I don't know whether Indians are already making this mistake. I hope they are not. They would make a fundamental mistake if they think that Europe is down and out. And I don't think they're stupid enough to make that mistake for the simple reason no country would take a decision on Europe by looking at Europe in totality. They would only look at a few entities in Europe, which is a practical thing to do. No country would say that Asia is gone by looking at Asia in totality. They would look at what's happening to India, China, Singapore, and a few other, other major economies. If these economies are holding up firm, then Asia is holding up firm. And I think to that extent, the concern is essentially with four of the big major European players who are part of the G8. And which include Germany, France, UK, Italy. Italy has unfortunately slipped into a group of pigs. But the rest of the three, irrespective of the troubles that they are facing, are not going to go down. Why are they not going to go down? Because of two important reasons. First, they have enough resilience. They have enough resilience, they have encountered difficulties before, they will go through. And secondly, the world will not let them go down. There is enough of backing of the international community to let these three economies hold up and prosper. As far as the rest of the countries are concerned, well, if Italy defaults $2 trillion, hardly matters much for a world economy which is far, far more ahead in size of trillions. Argentina defaulted on its debt payments to the IMF, the IMF is still up and down. Solid, bigger, larger than what it was before. As they say, what are a few trillions between friends? <laughs> so, from this point of view, it's just clearly very important to take a practical view of the situation in Europe for India and the rest of the countries in Asia and accept the fact that an economic entity and an economic presence like Europe is something which has not come up instantly and is also not going to vanish instantly. It's there to remain. It might be down on its knees for a while, but that does not mean that it cannot recharge its batteries. Now, this is a situation where the rest of the world, and particularly the emerging markets, have to be a little careful in taking Europe on. Now, one outcome of the way the world is probably not taking Europe very fairly or not probably appreciating the real virtues of Europe 
is the Copenhagen discussion in 2010, where the final draft was hammered out by five countries, none of which included a European country. Despite, despite Europe having had the history of maximum proactive action on climate change in Europe. Now this is where the emerging market countries would obviously punch about their weights. This is where they would also make a mistake if they think that future negotiations are going to take the Copenhagen path. It cannot. Somewhere or other, Europe has to come back into scenario because from India to the US, it is impossible to traverse without crossing the Europe. Metaphorically speaking. Now, this is where emerging markets have to accept the fact that EU is a presence in not only all major global forums, but in almost all regional forums as well. Even in the forums that are prominent in Asia, EU is present in most as an observer. So the views count. The problem is that coming back to Asia, there is a view which is there on Europe, and this is where probably it is important for Europe to take a look at history as well. <clears throat> Let me go back to 1997. Asia has recovered well and firmly from 1997, simply because it has learned from the crisis. It has taken note of the difficulties that it's experienced. All the economies are back on the robust track, except one. And no prizes for guessing that, that's Japan. Japan refused to learn the lessons of the crisis. And it made life very easy for China. I'm a great admirer of Chinese economic presence. This is not to say that China stepped into the vacuum created by Japan. But the fact of the matter is, that Japan's strategic economic significance in the region has gone down simply because it refused to learn the lessons of the Asian financial crisis. It refused to change its vision on economic issues and refused to become pragmatic. So as a result of which, there is now a view that Europe should not refrain from learning the lessons of this particular difficulty that it is going through. And what does it mean? The first and foremost is they should accept the fact that the world is changing. There's a very big world outside Europe. It's very important for Europe to understand that. And that world has a vision and dynamic of its own in different ways and different parts. They have customs, systems, visions, challenges, and opportunities which are very, very different from the way Europe would look at these issues. And it's important to take stock of the reality. And one of the very important points of that reality is that Europe has to look far more closely, proactively, engagedly at Asia Pacific. There are other countries of the world, major parts, major reason, which have very clearly accepted the Asia Pacific as the locus of all major future economic and strategic activity. Europe will only cause itself harm if it doesn't get into the Asia Pacific in a major and proactive way. And that might lead to prolongation of the downturn, and that might lead to crisis becoming a permanent level for Europe. Thanks. Thank you very much.